this Zoom replay was originally streamed autumn 2020 and is brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House US Menla membership community and viewers like you. Okay, so good evening, everybody. Welcome again. My name is Nick. Uh, it's nice to see you all here. Although admittedly, there are, <laughs> there are more folks than I can fit on one screen. So um, at least I know you're out there. I see some familiar names and faces, which is great. So we have about an hour and 15 minutes tonight to uh, talk a little bit about Yoga Nidra and to explain what that means for those of you that are uh, new to this concept or just getting to know it, or maybe some of you have been practicing for a long time. And also lucid dreaming, which is a related topic, but not exactly the same. And the inspiration for this talk um, came from a question that I got once upon a time when I was teaching Yoga Nidra and, and someone who worked at a yoga studio where I was teaching basically said, well, what's the difference between these? You know, how do they relate? And um, I find that, yeah, you know, it's, it's, we don't really have very clear definitions yet in the West of what yoga nidra is. I think it's still being defined. And lucid dreaming is a kind of um, anomalous thing that also pe some people think it's, it's uh, one thing or it's another thing. And it's, it's still really being defined in the West. Um, so let's start there. And then we'll take a moment to drop in together. But I feel like now that we're up and running, I might as well fill in the blanks. And, um, and the way that this next hour or so will flow is I'll talk a little bit about uh, how these two concepts and practices interrelate, the ways in which they're different, ways in which they're similar, and, and ways in which they basically complement each other. And, uh, and then we'll do some yoga nidra practice. And at that point, you'll have a sense of how the yoga nidra practice itself, which is essentially a guided relaxation practice, uh, will have an impact on your dreams and your lucid dreaming uh, practice as well. I'm not sure how far we'll go into um, how these ideas mesh with uh, traditional yoga, Tibetan Buddhism, and other indigenous cultures for whom dream yoga is, uh, is, has a long-standing tradition. Uh, in the West, again, these concepts are relatively new. We're still kind of feeling them out. Uh, there are very few practitioners, or at least practitioners who are really exploring the, those interrelationships. And uh, yeah, I think, you know, we're, we're kind of making it up as we go in a sense. So uh, in any event, yoga nidra means conscious sleep or dynamic sleep. Nidra meaning yoga, or pardon me, nidra meaning sleep in Sanskrit and yoga meaning union. So when we're talking about yoga nidra at this stage of the yogic tradition, we're not referring to yoga as the, so much the physical movements that you would come to associate with yoga. Uh, in the West, but the true meaning of yoga, meaning union between self and other, union between self and divine. So when we talk about yoga in the context of yoga nidra, we're talking about the, the true experience of yoga or oneness, interconnectedness. And the idea behind yoga nidra as a, as a, a kind of concept is that you can experience this union during sleep, you can practice uh, sleeping, both the onset of sleep and the um, ascendance from sleep as a, as a means to further your spiritual development and realize yoga uh, throughout all of the changing states of consciousness. So the idea that we are either awake or sleeping or dreaming, these are very crude dichotomies. And ultimately, what we're looking to do is to develop an understanding of the continuity between these shifting states of consciousness so that we can realize yoga or union or this um, pure being, you might say, the sense of 
complete awareness, total awareness throughout all of these changes. And lucid dreaming is a, basically a, uh, a practice of knowing that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. So for the most part, most of us, presumably, uh, when we sleep at night, we may have dreams are where we where our consciousness, where our awareness or sense of self shows up in those dreams that we may be very engaged in them. We may be witnessing them as if we feel it's their dream is kind of distant and we're watching it play out in front of us. And then there are on occasion, and for those of us that, that really attempt to cultivate these things, and for some of us who may be really gifted with this, uh, there are these moments of clarity where you know that you're in a dream uh, you know exactly where you are, you're sleeping in your bed, presumably, or in some other position. And at the same time, you can be cognizant of your, your state of consciousness, and at which point all bets are off, you might say. Uh, it's kind of like you're breaking into your imagination, you're hacking your imagination. And one big question is, well, okay, so if we have this potential, what do we do with it? What happens if you know that you're in a dream, and how can you then begin to shape that dream or not shape that dream? And what can you learn about the nature of consciousness and the self uh, in relation to this uh, capacity, this, this uh, exceptional experience? So that's a mouthful. That's a brief overview of these two ideas. And of course, Yoga Nidra, uh, you know, this first definition is this idea of having total consciousness or yogic awareness uh, in the midst of your sleep. But conventional, uh, you know, conventional teachings these days, when we talk about yoga nidra, we're referring to guided relaxation or a form of guided relaxation that's designed to bring about this yogic state of consciousness. So yoga is both a, a noun and a verb. It's a state of awareness we can realize, and it's also the practice of arriving at that, uh, that realization. Okay, so I'm gonna take a breath now. <laughs> and welcome again, everyone. So let's take a couple minutes here just to ground ourselves. Usually I would do that when we first come online, but it seems like we hit the ground running and, uh, or I hit the ground running anyway, because I'm aware that we don't have too much time to discuss something as far reaching as these uh, practices and philosophies. And at the same time, the essence of what we're after can be realized now without any effort at all. Seems pretty ironic. But this is really where it all leads. It ends and begins. <sighs> so you might take two or three nice deep belly breaths. Your eyes can be open or closed. For those of you that are long-time meditators or have a steady meditation practice, you can do your thing. Anything that I suggest is just a suggestion. So connecting with your breath. And you might let your breath drop down into your belly. Letting your belly expand as you inhale. And gently contract as you exhale. So connecting with our breath. And connecting with our body. 
our sense of our body. You might feel into the tips of your toes, the lengths of your legs, the base of your spine, your root. Feeling into all of your muscles and bones and just inviting a sense of softness. A kind of effortless effort. So connecting with our breath, connecting with our body, and connecting with the earth. The frequency of the earth, the place where all the birds and trees are hanging out, the pace with which the grass grows. It's a different kind of time. And recognizing that we are also the earth. and connecting with the cosmos, both inside and outside. The sense of infinity, infinity, infinite space. And if you prefer, it could be your sense of the divine, your sense of source, or the healing energy of the whole universe. And finally, you might imagine someone or something that may benefit from your practice, from this little bit of focused awareness that we're cultivating now. And imagine striking the tuning fork of your heart as if you were blowing a gentle breeze on the embers of your heart without too much effort, without the need to push anything or force anything, just bringing awareness to the heart and offering it up perhaps to this person or this animal or place. It could be to everyone here in attendance tonight. It could be to the whole world. Okay. So even as we transition a little bit, you don't have to stop this practice. If you want to call it meditation, if you call it prayer, if you call it being grounded or in your body, embodied, or just aware, they're all basically synonymous. And we can learn to live in this way. so that it becomes our default rather than something that we uh, turn on or off for a few minutes here or there every day or a couple times a week or something like that. So, again, welcome. Uh, my name is Nick, and it's a, an honor to be here with everybody tonight. 
like take two starting again. Um, a little bit about me. You may be wondering how I came to be here, uh, why, why I'm here, uh, why I'm speaking and you're not speaking. Um, I, was, I was invited by Menla uh, a few months ago, and I want to give a big thank you to um, Anne-Marie Miller, who uh, initiated this conversation and was the inspiration behind this talk. And um, I've had an interesting journey. About 20 years ago, I was a student at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. And for those of you that are practicing Buddhists, Emory might ring a bell as it's, um, there's a strong affiliation to Tibetan Buddhism and in particular to the Dalai Lama. So I was a senior at Emory and I took a course on called Tibetan Mind Body Healing. And this was my last semester in college and I was told that this was an easy A and that I should take this course and it'd be a breeze. So I signed up not knowing anything about Tibetan Buddhism, having really never meditated uh, much in my life, although I was doing things that I later realized were embodiment practices, mindfulness practices. And I was also taking a yoga class that last semester to fulfill my gym requirement in school. So these things came together right at, right at the same time. And um, interestingly enough, my professor was a, a fellow named Geshe Lobsang Tenzin Negi, or Neji. And uh, I didn't realize it at the time, but he was the head of the, and still is the head to this day, of the Drepung Losling Monastery in Atlanta, which is a really famous monastery in Atlanta. I think the largest in Atlanta, maybe even in the Southeast. And um, I also, maybe 20 years later, or somewhere along that line, learned that he had been appointed by the Dalai Lama himself to be the ambassador of Tibetan Buddhism in, this, in that region. You know, the Dalai Lama basically sent him to Emory to help become this, uh, this messenger. So a messenger of the Dharma. So uh, about a month into that course, we were visited by a, a professor named uh, Dr. Robert Thurman, who at the time, I meant nothing to me, I, although I, I guess I knew he was uh, Uma Thurman's dad. So we thought, okay, cool. Uma Thurman's dad is coming to, to speak with us. And he came and he, you know, he talked a little bit. And again, it was only much later that I, I put two and two together, realized who he was and his, you know, how uh, accomplished he is in this world. And um, to now find myself here tonight is truly a, uh, it's kind of feels in some ways like a homecoming. I don't want to read into it too much, but I, when I was uh, contacted by Menla, I thought it was pretty fascinating to have come full circle like that. So uh, if you believe in karma, you might say that's how this, this uh, has happened. But of course, it wouldn't matter either way because everything is uh, related. So uh, a month and a half, two months into that semester, I had a dream one night where I was shot between the eyes and died and went into a kind of nothingness, just a dark, empty space. I wasn't afraid. I thought that I may actually be dead. And I think I, the urban legend was that if you die in a dream, you actually die. So I'm passing through this kind of nothingness. It feels pretty blissful. And then I was reborn into a hospital room, you know, out of a birth canal and into a hospital room. And I was a 22 year old kid. So, uh, when I woke up from that, I was pretty amazed. You know, I immediately wrote down the contents of the dream. I didn't know what had happened, but I knew something had changed. Something was different. And I went and I told uh, Geshe La, my teacher, and he just kind of, you know, smiled and nodded. And, uh, it's kind of typical, right? He didn't, didn't say one way or the other what had happened. Um, around the same time in the yoga class all across the campus, I was introduced to this practice of yoga nidra, which was basically, consi basically consisted of the instructor guiding us into deep states of relaxation and meditation while laying down. So everyone would lay down in the room and she'd turn off the lights and take us into this meditation. And, and um, in retrospect, it was kind of a visionary experience. 
you know, things that I didn't think were possible, like seeing vivid colors and lights and, and uh, all kinds of, of cool visual effects in particular, um, you know, that became kind of commonplace, at least in her presence too. So the universe was conspiring, you might say. Uh, it was uh, several months after that, that I had a, a, my, what I would consider my first real lucid dream where I, um, I woke up in a dream, I actually fell out of bed and then realized that I saw the clock floating in the, on the, against the wall and I realized I was still dreaming and that I was now free in this dream to do whatever I pleased. And a voice said to me, practice yoga your whole life. I don't know who that voice was, what that voice was, but someone or something or higher self, whatever you want to call it, gave me this message. And it really set me on a course uh, that I'm still on to this day. So I, I share all this to say um, that there is something magical about the, the Tibetan tradition in particular, and maybe Buddhism more generally, something magical about yoga and something uh, truly profound and mystical about this practice of yoga nidra or learning to navigate the changing states of consciousness uh, and recognizing that the way we engage with the world uh, and, and I don't like to use these you know crude generalizations but for the most part we're on a kind of uh, narrow bandwidth you might say we see the world in a myopic way where we um, we take things for granted. We, we don't necessarily operate with the so-called beginner's mind where we are amazed by reality as it is. We see reality through a kind of filter most of the time because of any number of factors, mostly because of our, our story of who we think we are and what we're here to do and the mission that each of us is on each and every day when we wake up. And what meditation is teaching us to do and what these... Um, meditative traditions and insight traditions are teaching us to do is to stop, reconnect with ourselves, our breath, our body, the earth, and to realize that there is a much greater spectrum of information and experience available at our, at our disposal if only we took the time and, and the practice and learned how to open our eyes to that. So again, one way to do that, and there are lots of different ways, is to practice maintaining awareness and, and literally opening the body-mind uh, as we move in and out of sleep, and even while we're asleep. One of the things that, that really struck me um, initially in my learning about yoga was this, I'd, and dreams for that matter, because after those experience, um, experiences I mentioned, I started to take a vested interest in my dreams, recording my dreams uh, almost every night for the last you know, many years af after that uh, started. W what really struck me was this idea that most of us are awake, quote unquote, awake 16 hours a day, and then we have this eight hours of sleep at night, which could be totally chaotic, depending on what your dreams are like. Uh, it could seem really random. They might be quite meaningful, but they're generally out of our control. We're just a kind of witness to them, or we're, we're caught up in them, but we don't know that we're there. We don't even really know who we are in those moments. And um, the yogic traditions say that that's, can be wasted time in some respects, or on um, the positive, that's time that you could be practicing. You could devote that time to your growth. And we spend about 10 years of our lives in dreams, right? If you figure you live to be, say, 90 years old and you spend a third of that time asleep, that's 30 years of our lives asleep. And I, I realize 90 years old is kind of generous, but let's just use it for an example. That's 30 years of sleep and about a third of that time in dreams. So 10 years of our lifetime is spent in this dream world. And that is fertile ground for practice, for introspection, for beginning to understand 
more about who we are. And ultimately, if you really were to devote yourself uh, to understanding dreams and the potential of the dream state, it becomes an opportunity to be, uh, you might say, truly awake, even, even more conscious than we are in our waking consciousness. So there are lots of theories about lucid dreaming and, and what kind of state of consciousness it is. And my feeling on this is that uh, there isn't one kind of state of consciousness in lucid dreams. You could be uh, awake and aware in your dream and still reinforcing all kinds of egoic tendencies. Whereas uh, the al alternatively, you could be awake and aware in your dreams, deconstructing your egoic tendencies and opening it into a, a form of super consciousness. And anything in between, there is just this enormous spectrum. So lucid dreaming is less knowing that you're dreaming when you're dreaming. That's a kind of simple definition. But really, lucid dreaming is is a, an invitation to an entire realm or lucid complex, a whole realm of conscious experience ranging from rather dull consciousness to uh, at the other end, you might say yogic consciousness, what the traditions call samadhi or uh, jhana states, states of, of deep meditation. So, uh, the reason I'm, we're having this talk tonight, the reason I'm so interested in this is because I began to have those kinds of experiences. First, they were uh, kind of fleeting. And then as time went by, and again, I think this was, is due not just to um, all of the, the waking yogic practices that I might have done uh, during the day, but also uh, learning how to be more present in my dreams. And there are specific practices that you can do for that. So just change my view here. Um, again, it's a kind of broad topic, but let's, let's give you a kind of takeaway now, which is for those of you that have, uh, have not really invested that much time in your dreams, and you're, but you're finding these ideas that I'm talking about, this idea of exploring uh, it, it, exceptional experiences, exploring the more expanded states of consciousness or the more deep meditative states of consciousness, the very first thing that you'd want to do is to start journaling your dreams. And this has nothing to do with lucid dreaming proper. It's not a specific lucid dreaming technique. It's, it's not a really a yogic technique per se, but it starts to venerate this part of ourselves that for most of us is dormant, has been neglected. If we don't invest in our dreams, it, 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 like a muscle, it atrophies. So we have to really start to pay attention to our dreams, record them as best we can uh, as a means to basically fueling it with intention, fueling that part of ourselves with intention. So that's first and foremost, that's your, your way. And I'm a pretty firm believer that if you were to only do that, just to take this interest in your dreams and do your best to record them regularly, you'll start to notice changes in your dreams and changes in yourself, both in dreams and in waking. Okay? So dream journaling is very important, probably the most important piece to this. And second most important is what we're going to do in a couple moments here uh, is yoga nidra practice. Again, this is my, my take. It's a, a method or a formula that has worked for me and worked for others that, that I've uh, either taught, with, taught to or learned from. But the two go hand in hand because yoga nidra is training the body-mind to be a, alert and aware, but not hypervigilant. So when I say alert, to just be uh, conscious while the body sleeps. So basically, we're, I wouldn't say that we're separating mind from body. We're actually deeply embodying ourselves so that we can remain conscious as our body moves into sleep. And I'll, I'll repeat that again. And this will be a, something that we talk about 
in the workshop, uh, which comes up in about 10 days. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that at the end. But the idea here is that lucid dreaming and, and dreams in general, we, we don't really want to cultivate them as, as mental states and our mind somehow being separate from our body. So we, if you can imagine that your body goes to sleep, but my mind is wide awake. It's not really what we're after, in my opinion. What we're looking to do is to deeply embody ourselves such that our, our, the part of our body that we think of as sleeping is physiologically asleep. If you were to monitor it in a lab, you would say, oh, your body's asleep. But there are still, there's still consciousness that is awake in the body. So it's, it's an embodied experience or a body-mind experience rather than trying to cultivate mind and shed the body. That's not what we're after. We're trying to keep them together when we go to sleep. And what that does is it cultivates a deeper sensation, deeper embodied awareness in the midst of sleep. And that is what is going to make our dreams remarkable. When we're in our body, in meditation, while sleeping. And the last thing that I'll, I'll add to this idea, and there are of course lots of embodiment practices, but yoga nidra is really a juicy one because it's, we're already setting the stage for exactly what it is we're, we're after here. We're learning to be a body mind as we relax very deeply and, and come closer and closer to physiological sleep, uh, even into physiological sleep while maintaining that conscious awareness. Um, a last piece to this is for those of you that are, have had lucid dreams, that are um, interested in learning to lucid dream, you know, there are lots of, of um, guides online. You can look at lucid dream induction techniques, but you might also begin to explore waking yourself up uh, in the middle of the night or actually more specifically after about six hours. So assuming you sleep eight hours, you'd wake yourself up after six spend about 30 to 45 minutes meditating or doing yoga nidra practice, which is basically an approach to meditation, and then go back to bed. Your sleep will be lighter and you'll have a better chance of, of tapping into your last one or two REM cycles of the night. So you'll be, have a, a vivid dreaming state, states where you're, there's more opportunity to dream, more awareness of your dreams already, dreams are more vivid, and you'll have that little bit of extra uh, intention and consciousness with you. So that's called the wake back to bed technique. So after about six hours, you wake yourself up and then uh, meditate, go back to sleep. And lastly, what do you do once you're in this lucid dream? Uh, and this is, I think what, you know, uh, this, this is the part that I, I think as in our Western culture, we've yet to really um, honor properly in the same way that the, the Eastern and indigenous traditions have explored this for a long time. We have a tendency in the West to think of lucid dreaming as a technique of control, that we enter into these dreams and we can control the dream. In fact, if you were to look up the definition of lucid dreaming, uh, you wouldn't necessarily see Dreams where we know that we're dreaming, but dreams where we know that we're dreaming and can control the dream. And that aspect of control, particularly from the, the Buddhist standpoint, is a, um, is a mistake in some ways. If we try to control the dream, manipulate it, and, and even in a lot of uh, Western psychotherapeutic tradition, we'd say that you might be interfering with the, the natural flow or progression of the dream. And in, the, in this, you know, if you were to take a more, um, uh, let's, let's call it a, a Buddhist stance and try and, and control what's happening, uh, we miss out on what happens when we surrender, when we allow the dream to unfold in a kind of effortless effort. I think it may even be closer to a Taoist perspective, which is not doing, and that, which I think is really kind of the essence of meditation, is that it's, there's this effortless effort that you are, you're being, but not doing. So for, 
uh, those instances where you find yourself in a lucid dream, and I hope that you all do tonight or, or sometime soon, you might explore not trying to manipulate anything and just being present. And of course, the more you practice being present while you're awake, the easier it will be to maintain presence while you're asleep in the dream. Even when everything around you in the dream is going bonkers, you can maintain this sense of being centered and grounded and embodied, at which point the dream itself can dissolve because it's ultimately just mental chatter too. And you begin to see through that into a, um, a kind of spaciousness of the spaciousness of mind that is, I think, at the heart of what uh, the Tibetan Buddhist tradition in particular is, is after when they describe consciousness. You peel back the onion. So just being present in your dream and being able to, to do anything that you want is a kind of superpower. It's pretty special, and you're certainly welcome to explore it. But as a voice within lucid dreams once told me, lucid dreaming is a trap. If you get too caught up in trying to have lucid dreams and manipulate lucid dreams, you miss the bigger picture, which is pure awareness. And the way to understand, to realize pure awareness is simply to be there and accept what's happening without trying to change it and focus instead on trying to stay there trying to maintain the dream, to stay in this lucid place. Which is basically the goal of meditative practice too. Right? Your mind gets distracted, you come back. They say you fall down 107 times and you get up 108 times. So the moment that you realize I'm here, that's right where you want to be. So lastly, I know I said lastly already, and we're going to practice in a minute. The relationship then between yoga nidra and lucid dreaming is yoga nidra as a practice, as this guided or deep relaxation practice, which you can do for yourself without someone guiding you, is a way to uh, prep yourself for the lucid dream state. That's probably the easiest way to, to put these two together you can practice yoga nidra in your lucid dream. And by practicing yoga nidra in your lucid dream, you can arrive in yoga nidra, in the, the, the real essence of yoga nidra, the experience of yoga in sleep, of union during sleep. So lucid dreaming becomes this, this kind of um, platform, you might say, to explore deeper states of meditation. So we're going to do some practice now so you can get a sense of what yoga nidra is like. For those of you that have practiced yoga nidra before or have been doing it for a long time, you can uh, you know, just receive this. Really for everyone, I encourage you to get comfortable. You're welcome to sit. You could uh, lay down if you prefer. You could stand. You could even be walking. You don't need to look at the screen, though you're welcome to. And we'll practice for about 20 minutes or so. And I think yoga nidra as a practice is really so beautiful because it has implications on everything that we do. The idea here, again, is not to train yourself to be a really great dreamer, but to practice so that we become a really great person. And in our progression toward wholeness, we'll naturally find ourselves more aware in our sleeping states as well as in our waking states and in all the states in between.
So as you get settled, once again, connecting with your breath. Letting your breath drop down into your belly. You might take two or three nice deep belly breaths as a signal to your body mind that it's time to relax, giving yourself permission to relax. to soften and let your body go slack. Take a moment to imagine someone or something or some place that puts you at ease, that sparks an inner joy, as if you could crack an inner smile. Could be a person, past or present or imaginary, or your favorite pet, or a spirit animal, could be a memory of a wonderful time in your life. It could be a special place that you go to or went to as a child or have been along the way. Someone or something or some place that fills you with this deep rooted sense of joy, safety, and security. And we'll call this thing our ally. And as we practice, and at any time from now on, if and when you feel like you'd like to change your mood, you want to take your foot off the gas, and bring about good feeling in your body, you can imagine your ally. Spark good feeling in your body. And imagine connecting to the divine, whatever that means for you. The background of all things or the healing energy of the whole universe. Life force. as if you were resetting your internal compass. Welcome a sense of release and relaxation in the tips of your toes. You might imagine the healing energy welling up beneath the soles of your feet. Traveling up through the tops of your feet. 
your heels and your ankles. And even if your body doesn't relax right away, just giving yourself permission to soften as if you could surrender your body to the surfaces supporting you. Slowly traveling up through the lengths of your legs, softening your calves and shins, your knees and back and in front. And the lengths of your thighs and up into your hips and your hip sockets. Softening the marrows of your bones, the very centers of your bones, all of the tendons and ligaments fibers of your being. Everything soft and slack. Even softening the space around your legs. The space within your legs. Like you were slipping into a warm bath. And from the tips of your fingers, up through the lengths of your fingers, and softening your palms and the backs of your hands. Wrists and your forearms. elbows, upper arms, and your shoulders, and your shoulder sockets. Imagine softening the centers of your bones, the marrows of your bones. Everything soft, and slack. Softening your root, the space beneath your root, your pelvis and your groin, the base of your spine, tailbone and your sacrum, lower abdomen and your belly, softening your lower back, middle back and upper back. the length of your spine, and your whole back body. Your solar plexus and your sternum. Ribs chest and collarbone in front and in back. And your whole body from your neck down. Everything soft and slack. Softening the back of your neck 
and your throat. You could imagine your throat opening like a flower. And the weight of your head all of the muscles and bones of your face. Everything soft. Softening your jaw and the bones of your cheeks. The orbits of your eyes. and the centers of your eyes. Your brow. Forehead. Temples. And your scalp. softening your whole body and the space within your body, the space all around your body. Beyond left and right. above you and beneath you. Beneath the soles of your feet. And well beyond the crown of your head. Letting yourself be here without the need to do anything or change anything. Just being. as if you were giving yourself the break that we've always wanted to take. as if you could let it all go. Just be. You might feel back 
or feel into this place of pure awareness without any border or boundary as if all of this were playing out before you like a movie as if your body were inside of you inside of awareness just awareness spacious the emptiness that is full and the fullness that is empty. And in the next moment or two, you might take a slightly deeper breath into your belly. And if you like, you could take a look back over your experience as if you were emerging from a dream. taking note of anything that you might have found interesting, anything that may have stood out to you, any insight you may have received or messages from your unconscious or higher self. And if you like, you could place your hands against your body perhaps the hand over your belly and another over your heart or anywhere that they feel called. You could wiggle your fingers and toes. You can give yourself a little rub or a squeeze or a hug or a yawn or stretch. Slowly, gently bringing yourself back. If you're lying down, you're welcome to continue to lie down. But you could also come back up to a seat if you want. But as you move, moving slowly so that you maintain this healing resonance in your body-mind. We maintain this sense of presence, awareness, perhaps relaxation. It's possible you feel a little dazed or light afterward. You might feel heavier. You might feel energized. You could feel like you're ready for bed. Yoga Nidra does different things to different people at different times. So it's, it really is uh, unique, every experience. And again, you might imagine someone or something that could benefit from your healing energy, which ultimately is not yours, but a healing energy that we can all tap into. And without too much effort, without the need to force anything, just offering it up, maybe to all of us here, it is possible that we can all come into resonance together. You can feel the vibe over, over the internet here. It's just a physical manifestation 
or in some ways, I guess, a digital manifestation of our interconnectedness. It's an interface. And sooner or later, one would hope we'll be able to shed it too. So thank you for that. That was just a brief practice. Uh, they can be shorter or they can be much longer. Uh, and that's something that we also uh, can talk about in uh, the, the longer workshop that happens in a couple of weeks and um, that we talk about in, in our Yoga Nidra training, which I'll mention toward the end. Um, but in the interest of time, I thought we would take some time for questions. Well, we don't have too much time, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. So Eli, if you're there, um, you're welcome. Those of you that are, are still here and still with it, um, you can send him questions in the chat function. I think you said that was the easiest way to do it, or do you want folks to also raise their hand too? I guess there's no real bias on which one maybe I prefer or which one's easier. I think it's, if somebody has a very concise question, drop it in the chat. But if you have a little bit of extra context, feel free to uh, raise your hand and say it yourself in however you see best. If, there's, if you want to say something, but you're not sure what it is, which mm -hmm. I can completely relate to, then just uh, you can That's raise sure. your hand. Yeah, I and think with some of the subject matter, especially that I see with Menla, it's not always as easy to make your point in a question. Well, I can take this one from Carla. How long was that Yoga Nidra? Thank you, you feel renewed. I'm so glad. Um, that was about 20 minutes, maybe 25 minutes tops. I didn't, I didn't count it to the minute, but that was... Tip, for me, I, I typically aim for about 30 to 35 minutes for a full practice, although you'll see um, some people will guide 60-minute practices. So that was about half, half length. And um, one of the things that, that I teach in the trainings that, that we run um, is a, a protocol where there are steps that you take that show up in the Yoga Nidra delivery. So that was not the full protocol, but it was uh, one way of delivering the, the Yoga Nidra protocol. And it, you know, it's pretty arbitrary uh, as Yoga Nidra, the practice has really only been around for about 50 years in this way as, as a kind of protocol where you move through these various steps to, to, to guide relaxation. But again, the idea of Yoga Nidra has been around for thousands of years. But since, since the practice itself, this guided relaxation is only 50 years old, I think it's still wide open and you can, you can do just about anything you want with it. Uh, recordings available, Marta. Uh, yes, I'll mention that uh, at the end, if you can hang around for a few more minutes. But I'm honored. Uh, Ciara, what advice do you have for people who have trouble recalling dreams or staying aware during meditation yoga nidra? Well, they say a gram of practice is worth a ton of theory. Uh, I'm a firm believer that if you put your mind to something and you give it the appropriate amount of energy, intention, and hours, uh, it will come to fruition. Uh, you know, I, I've, come, I've come to accept that I'm never going to be a guitar virtuoso because I probably didn't start young enough, but I enjoy it. So I give it as much time as I can and I notice the results. And I think the same is with um, recalling dreams. If you start dream journaling uh, and you really have a, a, a real, you know, you put effort into it, you'll start to, to yield the fruit of that. Now, of course, there are... Um, Sometimes physiological issues, there can be substances, uh, every, anything from, from the foods and things we eat and the things that we drink to, uh, you know, uh, medicines that we take, things that interfere with our memory 
or our ability to, to remain uh, conscious during those times or our conscious recall of those times. So I would be careful about um, certain substances, cannabis, caffeine, alcohol, you know, the, the ones that sort of come to mind right away that can interfere with our, um, what you might say our peaked consciousness that, that can interfere with us being really clear and, um, and just, you know, keep, keep going, keep going with it. Lori asks, is this best done in bed before going to sleep or anytime during the day? Any time that you have to practice is the right time to practice, like all of this. Um, the, the movement that I'm really interested in is away from thinking of these things as, as practices or routines that we fit into our day when we can, which of course, you know, it is that. And we're looking to develop a baseline, um, a, a kind of default meditative state where we live in a perpetual state of presence. So the more you practice, the more you forge those neural signatures, if you prefer, the more you forge that body-mind connection so that your groundedness, your awareness becomes who you are, not something that you do. So if you have time when you get in bed before going to sleep, great. If you have time in the afternoon, nap time, great. If you have time in the morning, great. Uh, everybody's a little bit different and you'll have to feel it out to see what works best for you. Driving, while driving, not so great necessarily. Uh, be, be careful when you're doing things, you know, operating heavy equipment, stuff like that. Probably not the best time for deep guided relaxation. But um, you can learn to do this for yourself. So you can use recordings, and I'll mention mine in a moment. There are lots of them on YouTube and Insight Timer and all that stuff. Uh, but you can also teach yourself to do this such that it doesn't really take 30 minutes to, to go through a whole protocol. You, you just tell yourself to soften and you're there very quickly because you've created that learned memory. And it's almost like a muscle memory where you can relax more deeply quickly. It's called an autogenic response where you've created this, this um, network of associations such that you tell yourself to soften and you soften. Uh, when you are, so Cameron asks, when you are aware in a lucid dream, do you have any advice on staying relaxed? I often I wake up due to excitement. Exactly. Uh, th and this is what I was alluding to before, is that, you know, what happens in the lucid dream? And, and um, this is a good, a good uh, point, you know, a good segue, because I, I mentioned this idea of not controlling the dream, but more often than not, particularly for folks who are, um, who are first experiencing lucid dreams, but even all along the way, there are things that give us a shock. And what that is, is the, the body essentially, or the body mind um, divulging a, a kind of nervous impulse, you might say. It, could, it can manifest in the dream as a monster that gives us a fright, or it could be, um, you know, it can be just about anything. They're basically synonymous. You know, what we see in the dream is a reflection of the state of our being, the state of our body mind. So the more you practice things like yoga nidra and begin to use it as a space to address the nervous charges or energy blockages or things that, that give us, that prevent us from relaxing. And that's a whole other aspect of yoga nidra that we can't get into tonight, but it can become this space for processing our emotional uh, energy the processing our pent up emotion. So a lot of times we'll be in the dream and we either get too excited or we get afraid uh, or even, you know, it, it's, there's not enough happening. And it's, it, again, it's basically a reflection of what's going on in our nervous system. So the more we learn to temper our nervous system by practicing yoga nidra, which helps us stay relaxed, even as things get crazy or you get into the lucid dream and, there's this moment of, aha, I'm here. This is so cool. We have to learn to take a breath, soften into it, and let ourselves experience the joy and ecstasy or the fear and, and terror without getting too attached one way or the other. 
without letting us letting it disrupt our sense of presence. So it's just like meditation in that way, that you see these things happening, this impulse, the excitement. I call this capacity. It's our capacity to stay present even as the ecstasy is cranked up all the way or as the, the fear and anxiety is cranked up all the way. Either one is just a kind of manifestation or a, you might say a superficial manifestation that we can learn to witness from a place of equanimity. So the more we practice equanimity, the more we can see those impulses for what they are and disidentify from them. And sometimes there's just an aspect of, we have to experience it enough, we have to have enough lucid dreams where we get excited and lose our lucidity and wake up, or where we get afraid and wake up before we can notice, okay, you know, that happened last time, but this time I'm going to take a breath and stay calm and just let it happen through me without it letting it, uh, not letting it throw me in any one direction. Cool. I saw, I caught that camera. Thank you. It's a great question. I think that it's actually a huge question because it's probably the experience of most lucid dreamers because they're, um, and I don't know your, your situation in particular, but most lucid dreamers are not necessarily practicing really softening and being present. And that's, that's the key, is that you, you develop this such a peaceful seat in your own body-mind through your, your ongoing spiritual practice that when you find yourself in those instances, it's, it ain't no thing, as they say. It's just, just take it as it comes. And so, Nick, I think you should keep going with, I think there's another question, but if you want to go ahead and uh, mention the class on the 24th uh, first, make sure we get that in. Uh, sure. I don't, I'm not sure if there are any more questions. I think that might be it. Uh, did you get to the one with Cameron? Yes. Okay. All right. Wonderful. So yeah. That, yeah. So, so, okay. Um, then I guess we'll, we'll wrap it up. So I'll take just a couple more minutes here to share um, a little bit about, or to mention at least uh, 10 days from tonight on the 24th of October, we're going to do a four hour workshop, uh, two hours in the morning from 10 to 12, and then two more hours from two to four. It's, they're not separate. So you sign up for the one full course. And we're going to go deeper into all of these subjects, more opportunity to practice. So it will really, we tried to, this was a little bit like, you know, compressing a whole lot into a very small amount of time, uh, but hopefully helpful. So we'll have a chance to sort of unfold a little bit more uh, on October 24th. And you can register for that through Menla. The course is called Lucid Dreaming and the Transformative Self. So we'll talk and explore uh, experientially through breathing practice, through uh, guided yoga nidra practice, how we make changes to who we are and, and get closer to that realization of our, uh, what you might call our true self, if you believe in such things. But we start to shed who we think we are and really are able to, to listen to, to who and what our body-mind is, is asking of us. And maybe you could say even what the universe is asking of us. So dreams have the power to reveal this to us. Uh, and I speak from experience when I say that they, they have, they've profoundly shaped the course of my life in a way that I think is uh, positive. So I'm a, I'm a believer. And um, I, I run an organization called Evolutionary Education, which is an experiential learning platform. We've done lots of things in person, but increasingly now are online. And we actually just recorded a Yoga Nidra teacher training uh, earlier in September, or the end of September, and you can now access that online. So you can take the training, receive certification and all of that, uh, all through our website. So that's evolutionaryeducation.org. You can also find me at nickatlas.com. And I do uh, private work with people and, and all kinds of things for yoga teachers and therapists and just anyone who's interested in these 
uh, sleep, dream, relaxation, uh, increasingly psychedelics, a lot of ways of thinking about consciousness and exploring consciousness. Those are the, the areas I specialize in. Um, I wrote a book called The Light Travelers, A Mystical Journey. And it's a book about uh, really the first decade of my uh, spiritual awakening and my, these exploration of dreaming and uh, consciousness expansion and learning about who I am. But it's really more about a generation that is also waking up, you might say, and the, the more of the movement of, of um, exploring consciousness in our culture. And I, you know, it took me all over the world. So there are some really incredible stories of synchronicity and mystical experience and uh, nature, you know, lots of travel stories. So uh, if you're interested in that, you can find it at the websites I mentioned, Evolutionary Education or NickAtlas.com or on this website, thelighttravelers.com. That's where the book is. But there, you can, all three will take you to the same place. All roads lead to Ohm, which is a terrible joke. Um, Let's see. I, th I think really that's it for now. Uh, if you have any questions for me, I try to respond as much as possible so you can reach me through those websites. And, uh, and uh, you know, I'm happy to have some conversation with you. We have the, all different kinds of programs on there in addition to our Yoga Nidra trainings. And uh, I want to thank you all so much for, for coming out tonight and supporting Menla. I see that, uh, that uh, Eli has listed the um, you know, links for Menla in the chat as well, tibethouse.us and menla.org. Uh, these are, I, I think, I don't want to speak on behalf of Menla, but for, for those of us in uh, the wellness world that are used to doing lots of in-person retreats and things like that, these are difficult times, as I'm sure they are for, for many of you and your businesses. So please don't hesitate to... Um, contribute to Menla and the great work that they're doing because it's really a special thing and um, we need to support our institutes of learning. You know, it's really important that, that people have spaces for this. And I'm so honored to have had this space tonight. So I, I thank you all so much for, for coming. And um, I look forward to sharing a whole lot more about dreams and lucid dreams and how all of these things fit together the next time that we meet on October 24th. All right, I think that was wonderful. Uh, everybody you will see some of the links I have put down. Uh, once this uh, event ends and it will be put onto the landing page, you will see uh, in the chat that I have posted that link so you can have this recording. Uh, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. And thank you to Nick. And thank you to Menla and to Bet House. Uh, all the links are provided below so you can stay connected with all our communities. I also posted a donation link for Menla. Anything you can give is deeply appreciated and it goes a long way to support this work and helps us to continue offering such great practices like what Nick has provided for us tonight. Thank you all very much. The landing page is in the chat. You can save the chat yourself so that you will just have all the, those uh, links. You can also go and grab them individually if you'd like to. And you should be getting a link in an email that also provides the landing page with the video. So we definitely have you covered. I'm going to leave the room open for the next few minutes and it should shut down at about 8.30. Let's see you guys can all check in the chat and get yourself situated. And I will warn you before the uh, chat becomes closed. All right. Thank you for your participation and we hope to see you at any future Menla online events. Thank you for flying. Have a good evening. Thank you. Take care. Be safe, everybody. Much love. Safety and health to all your loved ones. Everybody staying uh, healthy this time. Take care.
This video was brought to you in part through the generous support of the Tibet House U.S. Menla membership community and viewers like you. To learn more about the benefits of Tibet House membership, please visit our websites at tibethouse.us or menla.org.